the first in a two-part series. What good is a religious tradition? What good is its philosophy? If it isn't based on revelation, truth itself. What good is it if we can't practice it? And if we can't practice it to its fruition, our own self-realization? And what good is it if we can't implement and incorporate it into every nook and cranny of our life? Vivekananda tells us, theory is very good indeed, but how are we to carry it into practice? If it be absolutely impracticable, no theory is of any value, whatever, except as intellectual gymnastics. The Vedanta, therefore, as a religion, must be intensely practical. We must be able to carry it out in every part of our lives. And to drive this point home, once I asked Swami Sarvagatananda, Swami Akhandananda's disciple, who was the former head of the Boston and Providence centers, how to make the mind more one-pointed in meditation. And his answer surprised me. Do you know how to purify the mind, he asked me? Do you know what, it, what is purity of mind? Unselfishness, working for others, serving others. He explained, Swami Atulananda, who was the first Western saint in the Ramakrishna order, and he was a great Adoitan, he was also Christian raised, visited all of our other monasteries in India, and then came back to Swami Kalyanananda, who was one of Swami Vivekananda's disciples, in Kankal, where he had established one of the first hospitals in our order, and said, you know, Maharaj, our monks have a purity that other monks and other orders do not have. Swami Sarvagatananda explained, that comes from karma yoga. He then added, do you know how the rishis lived in the Vedic age? They were married, but illumined. So purity is unselfishness. So Swami Sarvagatananda's formula for concentration of mind was purity equals unselfishness. Vivekananda explained a corollary of his practical Vedanta. He said the fictitious differentiation between religion and the life of the world must vanish. For the Vedanta teaches oneness, one life throughout. The ideals of religion must cover the whole field of life. They must enter into all of our thoughts and more and more into practice. So here, it's important to note that Vedanta principles have to be realized and taught, not only by the rishis in the forests, but by people living in the world, leading the busiest lives, ruling monarchs. King Jvaibali taught Sveta Ketu the secret of death and renunciation. Sri Krishna taught Arjuna the highest truths on the battlefield, including profoundly practical secret of action, particularly relevant to this topic. Sri Krishna said in the fourth chapter, verse 18, he who sees the inaction that is in action and the action that is in action is wise indeed. Even when he is engaged in action, he remains poised in the tranquility of the Atman. So we can take this teaching into every field of our life. Vivekananda, real activity, which is the goal of Vedanta, is combined with eternal calmness, the calmness which cannot be ruffled, the balance of mind which is never disturbed, whatever happens. So that's the goal. When we master even-mindedness, 
or even greater, attain an awakened insight into the felt reality of this inaction that is in action, the better we work. The two go together. See, we can sit for hours watching videos on Adoita Vedanta, but it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't change us. Yes, we've engaged the mind in a positive, constructive, elevated hour, but what really matters is how we take those teachings into the field of action so that we assimilate it into every muscle, every nerve, that we become incorporated with the ideals and we ourselves are the teacher, how much we, how much we have a relationship with these ideals. That comes out in the field of action. This is one of the greatest examples of practical Vedanta. Vivekananda explains a simple fact we already know. He said, when we let loose our feelings, we waste so much energy, shatter our nerves, disturb our minds, and accomplish very little work. The energy which ought to have gone out as work is spent as mere feeling, which counts for nothing. It is only when the mind is very calm and collected that the whole of its energy is spent in doing good work. So we see that when we have been blessed and have the good fortune to see an aspirant who has attained that state of inner calm, their work conveys an unmistakable presence, a darshan of the divine. It's really something to behold. It's tangible. It's palpable. So there are two tendencies in human life. First, we can harmonize the spiritual ideal with our life, manipulate the ideal to justify our lifestyle. So the ideal becomes diminished and reconciled with our personal self-interest. And we rationalize, rationalize practicality with what we like to do. Or we can elevate our life to the ideal. How to do that? We must first be intellectually grounded in the Vedanta truth. We must own this Vedanta intellectually. And the first Vedanta principle is this divinity within is unborn and undying. Death is a superstition. That's why Vedanta first teaches us to have faith in ourselves. Simply put, those who don't believe in themselves are atheists because the self is within. This is the higher self, the self with a capital S. We must know that, feel that, be convinced of that. Swami Vivekananda, all the powers in the universe are already ours. It is we who have put our hands before our eyes and cry that it is dark. Take the hands away and there is the light which was there from the beginning. Darkness never existed. Weakness never existed. We who are fools cry that we are weak. We who are fools cry that we are impure. Thus Vedanta not only insists that the ideal is practical, but that it has been so all the time. And this ideal, this reality, is our own nature. Now the second Vedanta ideal is the unity of existence and all that that means. So let's deep dive. Vivekananda tells us, a man may see a great deal of difference between grass and a little tree. But if you mount very high, the grass and the biggest tree will appear much the same. So, he said, from the standpoint of the highest ideal, the lowest animal and the highest man are the same. If you believe there, there is a God, the animals and the highest creatures must be the same. 
This reminds me many times while at our Santa Barbara Center compound, which is, encompasses 50 acres. Swami Prabhupada would tell us, no person or creature who steps onto this property is insignificant. They have some stuff in them. And he was talking about all of the friends, the devotees, the impossible people, and including animals, stray animals that would come. And we would take them in and they would become part of our family. In Bengal, India, you all have heard the story of the famous scientist who discovered this principle of unity through his vocation, Dr. J.C. Bose. He lived from 1858 to 1937 and performed experiments with the sensitivity of plants to external stimuli. Swami Sri Dharananda used to love to tell the story. Uh, and when he met Madame Bose, she, she, she was the first one to share the intimacy, the, the intimate details of that story. Every night, J.C. Bose would close the Institute at 5 p.m. and he would come down from the Institute to their home, their dwelling. And one night he missed and Madame Bo said to him, I'll put your supper in the ante room, but it was untouched for three nights. And she asked him why? And he said, I'm right in the thick of it, meaning his experiments with plants and the consciousness within them. So Madame Bose told him, I'll put all of your meals in the ante room, eat when you can, but don't injure your health. And a week went by and finally J.C. Bose appeared his eyes shining, and he said, I have seen that consciousness by which plants respond to external stimuli, and I have also experienced the reality behind that consciousness. Swami Brahmananda, disciple of Sri Ramakrishna and the first president of our order, visited the Institute of Bose's junior scientist, Boshi Sen and watched the experiments with great interest. That evening, Maharaj was still preoccupied with what he had seen in the laboratory. And he said, there was a time when Sri Ramakrishna could not step on the grass, but would jump from one bare spot to another to avoid hurting the grass. At that time, we simply didn't believe that grass could be sensitive. From what I saw today, I realize how infallibly true his perceptions were. And to Boshi Sam, he said, don't give up your science. You will get everything through this. So this principle of the same divine consciousness pervading all is what guides the indigenous in America, Australia, and the Amazon to name just a few places in the world, as well as many ecologists in honoring the earth and trying to protect her from the ravages of big business and selfish interest. It has also inspired naturalists, such as John Muir, whose activism saved Yosemite Sequoia National Park, securing land for some of the nation's most inspiring commons. John Muir, he was an ecstatic nature mystic. He lived from 1838 to 1914. He was Scottish American and he founded the Sierra Club. Muir recorded, sketched plants, climbed mountains, hiked Indian trails, and built a small cabin wherein a stream flowed through it and enjoyed the sound of the running water. He had a conversion experience. He said, we are now in the mountains and they are in us. Kindling enthusiasm, making every nerve quiver, filling every pore and cell of us. Our flesh and bone tabernacle seems transparent as glass to the beauty about us, as if truly an inseparable part of it, thrilling with the air and trees, 
streams and rock, in the waves of the sun, a part of all nature, immortal. He became a part guide, your writer, natural theology was his, his religion, God being always present in the creation of life, and nature reveals the mind of God. Nature is a great teacher. His ecstasies, he experienced the presence of the divine in nature. During the earthquake of 1872 near Lone Pine, he felt Yosemite Valley, it woke nearer. He ran out of the cabin, both glad and frightened. A noble earthquake, he claimed. In a thunderstorm, he climbed a tree to feel how the tree might feel in the wind, the power of nature, the power of property. In the sequoia forests, it was as though it was a religious worship. Do behold the king in his glory. King Sequoia, he said, behold, behold. Seems all I can say. Some time ago I left all for Sequoia, have been and am at his feet, fasting and praying for light. For is he not the greatest light in the woods, in the world? Reminds me, right after my sannyas, when I went to uh, Portland to be with my sannyas guru, Swami Sheshamanta, he took a small band of devotees to the ocean. It was several hours from the center. And as the car descended through the forest, he turned to me and he said, Brahma Prana, Vara, tree, that is the first image the Hindu worshiped. Through his sensory perception, Muir developed insight into the nature of light. Mountain skies seemed painted with light, symbolized divinity, he said. The Sierras along the eastern margin of the Great Valley of California rises the mighty Sierra. So luminous, he said, it seems to be not clothed with light, but wholly composed of it like the wall of some celestial city. Jean Carr, his mentor, wrote and said, I have often in my heart wondered what God was training you for. He gave you the eye within the eye to see in all natural objects, the realized ideas of his, meaning the Lord's mind. Or, as expressed in our Hindu tradition, in the Kena Upanishad, he gave him the eye of the eye, ear of the ear, breath of the breath. Swami Vivekananda stated, oneness is the secret of everything. That realization of oneness is available to monarchs, scientists, naturalists, artists, to every man and woman to you and to me. Vivekananda presents a striking corollary, corollary to this underlying unity of existence, the unity in variety. He explained, all is one, which manifests itself either as thought or life or soul or body, and the difference is only in degree he stated. So what does this mean? What does this mean to us? We must try to see behind this appearance. From this frame of reference, illumined insight, the non-dual paramartika state. We can do this by trying to visualize the real Swami Vivekananda guides us in his inspired talks at Thousand Island Park. He stated, look at the ocean and not at the wave. See no difference between the ant and the angel. Every worm is the brother of the Nazarene. How say one is greater and one less? Each is great in his own place. 
This is coming from the standpoint of vision. It's a radical statement, a radical truth, until and unless we make that unitary experience our own, as others have. Swami Prabhupada related what he had heard from his guru, Swami Brahmananda. One day, Swami's Vivekananda, Brahmananda, and several other brother disciples were seated on the western veranda of the Belamat. Suddenly, Swamiji, meaning Vivekananda, said to Maharaj, Swami Brahmananda, Raja, don't you see Brahman? Brahman is everywhere. Maharaj said that Swamiji's spiritual awareness was so intense that their minds were lifted up immediately and they saw Brahman everywhere. We too can make headway toward that experience by trying to remind ourselves of this grand truth in every encounter we have in our present dualistic Yavaharika state, which sees subject and object. How? It is by making the revelation our practice. By reminding ourselves that each individual we meet is a wave, essentially is the ocean, a manifestation of pure consciousness that we in turn begin to elevate, purify, and transform ourselves within. And gradually divine sight opens up what the Kena Upanishad refers to as the eye of the eye, that spiritual eye that awakens within us. That is the eye that sees the spirit. There's also a second corollary where the awakening of divine sight by which we experience Brahman, the all-pervading underlying unity, that changes how we experience the pairs of life the pairs of the opposites of life, Vivekananda. The difference between weakness and strength is one of decree, he said. The difference between virtue and vice is one of degree. The difference between heaven and hell is one of degree. The difference between life and death is one of degree. All differences in this world are of degree and not of kind, because oneness is the secret of everything. So let's deep dive into this truth. This Brahman, pure all-pervading consciousness is the secret ingredient that transforms everything. And then we begin to understand that death is but another form of life. Sri Krishna tells Arjuna in the Gita, Second chapter, verse 13. Just as a dweller in this body passes through childhood, youth, and old age, so at death he merely passes into another kind of body. The wise are not deceived by that. Swami Prabhupada would tell us most of us are deceived, thinking that this life is the only existence. But the wise See that there is really no such thing as death. There is really no such thing as death. The illumined soul understands that death is but another form of life, nothing more. Therefore, nobody can become completely annihilated or destroyed. So what happens at death? The illumined see what we cannot. And here I'm reminded of a beautiful example I heard from the Swami when my last trips to India. Swami Yatishwananda, a disciple of Swami Brahmananda, was staying at the Bangalore Mott when one of his close brother disciples passed away. When he was told the next day, he said, oh, last night I saw Maharaj, Swami Brahmananda, pacing before my door and I was so happy to see him. Now I know he had come from my brother disciple. You see? Now let's take Vivekananda's thought one step 
even further. This truth that all differences in the world are of degree only, coupled with the theory of reincarnation, means that there can be no permanent suffering or eternal damnation for any living creature. All are evolving toward perfection because that perfection, that unity is innate. It's already within every one of us. It's our true nature. We need only unveil it. Swami Prabhupada commented, Sri Krishna avows in the sixth chapter, verses 40 to 45, though we may all fail many times to rise to perfection, the freedom of the Atman within all will ultimately prevail and lift each individual upward. All that is needed is a little desire for God. That's all. When that desire grows stronger, a struggling soul, no matter how degraded from past actions, will gain strength from within and will be lifted up. So then how can we show contempt for others? Vivekananda tells us, criticism and condemnation is a vain way of spending our energies. For in the long run, we come to learn that all are seeing the same thing, are more or less approaching the same ideal, and that most of our differences are merely differences of expression. There is yet another angle to this from the dualistic Vyagaharaka standpoint, our ordinary consciousness. If we accept the law of karma, we must also accept its broader ramifications of why we must necessarily show charity and compassion towards others. Why? Vivekananda spells it out in his bold assertion. What are you but mere machines until you are free? Should you be proud because you are good? Certainly not. You are good because you cannot help it. Another is bad because he cannot help it. The woman in the street or the thief in the jail is the Christ that is being sacrificed that you may be a good man. Such is the law of balance. They are all my teachers. All are my saviors. There's a beautiful example of this in Vivekananda's life. And he demonstrated where he demonstrated that elevated loving consciousness when he was on a trip to Egypt with Madame Colvet, Josephine McLeod, and a few other traveling companions, Madame Calvet wrote we'd, that they'd lost their way. And then they entered a squalid, ill-smelling street with half-clad women that lolled from windows and sprawled on doorsteps. Vivekananda noticed nothing until a noisy group of women on a bench in the shadows of a dilapidated building, began to laugh and call to him. It was a lady in the travel party that tried to hurry him along, but Vivekananda detached himself gently from the group and approached the women on the bench. Poor child, he said, poor creatures. They have put their divinity into their bodies. Look at them now. And he began to weep as Jesus might have done before the woman taken in adultery. The women were silenced and abashed. One of them leaned forward and kissed the hem of his robe, murmuring brokenly in Spanish, hombre de Dios, hombre de Dios, man of God. What are some of the inspiring ways in which we can elevate our life to this ideal. Prison reform is one. In India, Dr. Varta Kadanda, a prison reformer and founder of Tinka Tinka movement, promotes literacy, creative writing, art, literature, and skill development in jails and prisons by granting awards to inmates for their outstanding works. There's an example in 2015, Manjit Singh, a lifer 
that means he was in prison for life, was awarded a special prize in prose for his book, The Story of Awakening My Soul, about changes in his life in prison. It reminds us of what Vivekananda said, let a man go down as low as possible. There must come a time when out of sheer desperation, he will take an upward curve and will learn to have faith in himself. There is a prison Shakespeare programs. These programs have also had a dramatic impact on inmates in America. Why Shakespeare, we might ask. Christopher Zoukas, an investigative reporter for Huffington Post, reported on the Marin Shakespeare Company, which began teaching Shakespeare in the San Quentin prison in 2003 and expanded to several other facilities. Zoukas noted, this, these examples are, are the spirit awakening. Studying Shakespeare teaches complex language and literacy skills critical thinking about human emotions and the consequences of choices, emotional intelligence, empathy, self-reflection, and gives rise to the exploration of new ways of thinking. Leslie Courier, the managing director of the company, explained that inmates delve into complex themes while exploring Shakespeare, Macbeth and Julius Caesar, are about committing murder and the psychology behind that why they do what they do, how they feel after they have done it. And by working through these heavy emotional topics via fictitious character, inmates are able to self-reflect on their own situations and past decisions. Lifers in one prison performed Shakespeare's Titus, and this story moved me deeply. The central character, who murders five people during the play, including his own son and daughter. One inmate who played the part of Titus described how he witnessed firsthand, as it were, the warped mind of this foul murderer through his own keenly focused mental lens as he reenacted this drama, an internal mental emotional drama that mirrored in many ways his own murderous trajectory. And in the middle of the play, he broke down and wept in compassion and repentance. Vivekananda, how do you know what possibilities lie behind that degradation on the surface? You know but little of that which is within you, for behind you is the ocean of infinite power and blessedness. Bo Lozov, director of the Worldwide Peace Ash Prison Ashram Project, an organization which supports prisoners who seek inner growth, wrote the book, We're All Doing Time, modeling the prison cell to the monastic cell. The book includes sayings and stories from the world's various religious traditions, including the Ramakrishna Vedanta tradition. And in fact, in the Vedanta Society of Southern California, we have received appeals from prisoners all over the United States who have read Lozov's book and wanted to deepen their spiritual lives. You see, prisoners are not a part of our work. They're very much a part of our work. Through years, a number of our monks, nuns, and devotees have, scores, have corresponded with these inmates and sent them books upon request, gratis. One prisoner in particular was a lifer who took up Sanskrit in a high security prison here in Texas and became devoted to the Vedanta teachings. He began writing to Swami Swahananda and sought initiation from him. And seeing his sincerity, Maharaj out of compassion initiated him over the phone and sent him a blessed mala through the mail. He later requested me as his personal secretary to continue writing to this inmate which I did for some time until one of our male devotees took over this service. So this is part of our Vedanta humanitarian work in America. For after all, Vivekananda inspires us with his message. We shall see how this Vedanta can be carried into our everyday life, the city life, the country life, the national life and the home life 
of every nation. For if a religion cannot help man, wherever he may be, wherever he stands, it is not of much use. It will remain only a theory for the chosen few. He went on, this Atman is first to be heard of. Hear day and night that you are that. Repeat it to yourself day and night till it enters into your very veins. Till it tingles in every drop of blood. Till it is in your flesh and bone. Let the whole body be full of that one ideal. Think of it day and night. Meditate upon it. And out of that will come work. Action will come. And what is the nature of that action? Karma yoga. And what is the formula for karma yoga? Action inspired by knowing there is one self and all, and its corollary, the unity of all existence, automatically decompartmentalizes our view of secular and sacred. We no longer tolerate a job so we can afford how to live and whom we can love. We work as worship and that expands our spiritual arena to include our church, yes, our workplace, our home, our every action. Ultimately, we arrive at a state where our work becomes worship, where serving others as a living God becomes jnana yoga in action. And herein, something is transmitted. Karma yoga, as Theva yoga, bestows us with ananda, a joy within ourselves, which is conveyed to those whom we serve. How can this yoga be integrated into society? And what happens when it does, often unknowingly? One example is how karma yoga, selfless service, works as a therapy. I was fascinated by the returning vets from Vietnam and worked, as I said in a previous talk, with Walter Capps, uh, who wanted me to form some kind of a psychological therapy for the vets uh, in Santa Barbara, based on a Vedanta tradition, a Vedanta yoga tradition. But I read an article of the war veterans who entered into the humanitarian service of the mission continues. And it was so effective in dealing with post-traumatic stress in the vets. In a 2013 Time Magazine article, How Service Can Save Us, Joe Klein showcased the mission continues an organization that promotes service projects for vets. I had read about Ian. He was suicidal, a suicidal war vet. And he said, I saw these guys doing these very simple things. Nobody can argue with helping to paint a wall for a disabled or a homeless kid. That's just good. There's no bad in that. And he slept that night for the first time in months. I thought, man, if I could just capture a little bit of that and hold it close to my heart, I think I could do all right. Things could get better. And he stopped drinking and he moved the gun from his bed. He applied and received six months of public service fellowship from the mission continues. He joined the staff as a service project coordinator. He was so successful that he was summoned to the White House to serve as an intern with joining forces, Michelle Obama's effort to help war, to help war veterans. And he went on to complete a degree in international studies at Washington University in St. Louis. Today, the mission continues works with over 10,000 volunteers. There's been a study of 52 of these mission continues fellows conducted by Dr. Monica Matu and three colleagues that showed the dramatic improvement in well-being after a six month fellowship in selfless service. 52% of these 
Four vets had suffered traumatic brain injuries. 64 were diagnosed with post-traumatic stress. And out of this project, 86% reported positive life-changing experience. 71% furthered their education. 86% reported the program helped them to transfer their military skills to civilian employment. Combat vets, community service activism. They, build, they built houses, work and healthcare. They teach, they counsel, they farm, and they care for seriously wounded vets. Selfless service, Seva Yoga, universal prescription for well-being. So this is practical Vedanta. By serving others, I am serving myself, the same self in all. This is how we learn to assimilate the teachings of Vedanta into our own self, our own being, so that it penetrates our blood, our nervous system, our muscles, so that we are completely integrated with this practical Vedanta. And we allow this axiomatic truth to work its magic. I feel fulfilled and the recipient feels elevated. And when we work in such a way, there comes a day when we realize what Vivekananda promised us long ago. All the answers that came were from your own hearts. So friends, let's try to stabilize these teachings within us with a guided meditation. Let's sit straight. This is a meditation on unity. This is what we have been talking about, the unity of existence. Swami Ashokananda, who was a former head of the San Francisco Vedanta Society, was a great Advaita. He once said that even if you do not believe in God, you can meditate on unity. So let us close our eyes and take in three deep breaths. Feel your body as a field of vibration from head to toe. Feel yourself as a field of vibration. If we focus on a place on our back, we feel a point of vibration. If we feel our hands touching, there is another point of vibration. When we sit quietly, we intuit unity, unity pervading all. There is unity behind all our perceptions. Try to feel the unity is the background of all perceptions. In the midst of all thoughts and perceptions, there is unity behind, pervading all. Feel your body. Feel the room around you. Feel the world beyond the room. Feel the perceptible unity pervading everything you experience. Everything is a vibration or wave in the ocean of unity. The 
body's presence is a vibratory presence in the ocean of unity. Be aware of the body as a floating vibration in the ocean of unity that anchors you to this meditation in the here and now. Om Shanti, 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 peace, peace, peace.